Professor Ivan Kachanovsky is professor at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. He's the author of Cleft Countries, Regional Political Divisions and Cultures in Post-Soviet Ukraine and Moldova. And he is co-author of Historical Dictionary of Ukraine and the Paradox of American Unionism, Why Americans Like Unions More Than Canadians Do But Join Much Less. And he is writing three new books on the conflicts and politics in his native Ukraine. He previously held academic positions at Harvard University, the State University of New York at Potsdam, the University of Toronto, and the Klug, Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. Please welcome Professor Ivan Kachanovsky. Thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, for invitation. It is a pleasure to join your show. So Ukraine, let's focus on Ukraine. Professor, you were born in Ukraine? Uh, yes, I'm originally from Ukraine and I research Ukraine professionally since I got my PhD in the United States. And I can say that based on my research, uh, Ukrainian politics is more interesting than Hollywood movies. And I'm telling this to my students and to other people because uh, currently Ukraine is in the middle of a major war, which has impact not only on Ukraine and Ukrainians, but on the entire world. Right. What you're in Canada. What are let's start with Joe Biden, our president. What is he doing right? What is he what is he getting that? Uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't get? What does he understand? I think uh, he um, is a very important player in this war taking place right now in Ukraine because um, uh, Putin uh, started this war. He invaded Ukraine illegally uh, in violation of international law in February of this year. And this was uh, not justified by any uh, danger, military danger from the United States or from Ukraine. Even so, uh, Putin mentioned a variety of reasons for invading Ukraine, like, uh, for instance, um, the nazification of Ukraine or Ukraine joining NATO. There was no such possibility of Ukraine joining NATO in for the foreseeable future, and Ukraine is not a Nazi state in any kind of any form. So in this regard, uh, Biden uh, um, it was correct that he rejected such uh, uh, false reasons or false justifications by Putin in order to invade Ukraine by violating international law. So in uh, another important um, I think, uh, issue which uh, was done correctly by Biden uh, is that he decided not to get United States involved directly in this war, because this would mean a possibility of a nuclear war between Russia, which is a major nuclear power in the world, and the United States, which is another major nuclear power. So in such case, it would be very dangerous, not only to Ukraine, but also to countries like the United States and Canada. Okay. Thank you for that. What is he getting wrong? I think uh, the issue is, uh, I'm not sure if this is wrong or not, but uh, he actually uh, justified uh, the war in Ukraine, in particular, our Biden uh, justifying supporting Ukraine in this war by the need to support Ukrainian democracy and uh, to support Ukrainian sovereignty. But according to my research, Ukraine is not a democracy, it's largely an undemocratic state, and it's actually similar to Russia in this regard. And in terms of Ukrainian sovereignty, again, uh, Ukraine is, uh, became basically very dependent on the Western countries, including the United States, which have a very significant effect on policies of the Ukrainian government, and, and uh, in particular in this war. And just today there was a uh, uh, major Ukrainian uh, publication in which uh, there was a revelation that uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom visited uh, Zelensky in Ukraine uh, in the beginning of April of this month. And he specifically told Zelensky not to negotiate with Putin and not to make any peace deal with, uh, with uh, Putin. And this was a decision which was accepted by Zelensky. So this is just one illustration of this uh, case. So in this is I think very important issue as well. And I think another issue which is um, very important is that uh, Biden and other Western governments try to use war in Ukraine, which was started by Russia uh, as a proxy war 
with Russia. So they want to uh, basically use this war to weaken Russia. And this is openly admitted by uh, top uh, leaders of the United States and by many other Western governments officials. Many of my listeners say there's no negotiating with Vladimir Putin, that he is hell bent on reclaiming Ukraine and there's nothing Joe Biden could have said before the invasion to prevent it. Is that true? Uh, I would respectfully disagree because I studied this uh, conflict in Ukraine uh, for a very long time. This is my specialty, I wrote my dissertation on this topic and I follow um, conflict in Ukraine very closely before it actually started. And actually I warned about possibility of such war in my uh, television interviews in Canada and in my publications in, uh, in Canadian magazine called Canadian Dimension and in the US media before this war started. And I said that it was possible actually to prevent this war, which would be very devastating to Ukraine by uh, reaching a peaceful resolution to this conflict. It was possible to avoid this war by, for instance, having a peace deal in which Ukraine would become a neutral country in exchange for, um, for agreement uh, from the European Union to join, uh, for Ukraine to, to have possibility to join the European Union and agree to fulfill Minsk agreements, which were a major issue for Russia. Uh, and Russia used this also to justify its invasion of Ukraine. So there was such possibility and uh, Zelensky and the Western governments, in particular Biden, uh, administration uh, did not uh, use such opportunity. And even after the war started, there was a real possibility of this deal, which would be, would, which would have avoided escalation of this war and casualties in Ukraine and also affect many other countries. At the end of March, uh, there were negotiations in Istanbul and there was a, a suggestion by Zelensky to basically agree to neutral status of Ukraine, non-NATO membership, and in exchange, Russia would uh, basically would uh, just uh, take control over, um, uh, would uh, basically uh, uh, take, uh, uh, or would, uh, uh, would uh, retreat from uh, territories which it, uh, it was captured with the exception of Donbass in Eastern Ukraine and with the exception of Crimea, which it annexed. But there was such possibility of this deal uh, and it was real. Okay, so uh, we're, we're talking with Professor Ivan Kachanovsky, professor at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. And he is, I'm sorry, did you say? Oh, I have to mute somebody here. Some, uh, we're, we're picking up, hang on for one second. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, let me, because you're talking to America, we automatically assume somebody has an agenda and we have to filter it through the prism of your agenda. You're, you're Ukrainian? Uh, yes, and I'm originally from Western Ukraine and I'm a Ukrainian and uh, I'm uh, also Canadian. Uh, I live in Canada and I lived for a very long time in the United States. I got my PhD in the United States, uh, actually okay. in the direction of uh, two Leading political scientists. Oh, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm just, uh, let me ask you about, uh, are you a Russian speaking Ukrainian? Um, no, I, I speak Russian like uh, most Ukrainians do, because this is uh -huh. uh, basically, uh, this was taught in schools and university, but I am a native Ukrainian speaker. So I speak Ukrainian. Um, okay. I'm originally from Western Ukraine, close to Poland, which is uh, traditionally is very anti Russian in terms of its right. um, kind of po politics and policy. And I never... Okay. Let I me ask you some... Russia. Okay, let me ask you some rude questions, yeah. and I apologize, okay? I'm, these are rude questions, but I live in America, and we are a rude people. Did you welcome Vladimir Putin as a liberator? When, when, they, when they marched into Ukraine, did you say we're saved? Obviously not. This is, I mentioned this from the start, this was illegal invasion. It was not justifiable in any way. And I said this in uh, publicly, in my television interviews, in Ukrainian media, in Ukrainian television, in Canadian television interviews, in other uh, social media. So this is like... Uh, kind of okay, I think they're insulting questions, but you're talking 
to people a very insulting country, America. So you, you're a Ukrainian. You did not welcome Putin as a liberator, but you do think it was possible to have prevented the invasion. So let, 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 me, let me just continue along these lines, if you don't mind. Um, do you believe that Ukraine and Russia share a common heritage that that dates back to you know 600 years ago or some odd years ago and that they're they should be united as one uh, this like is um, actually it was topic of my dissertation uh, actually eastern part of ukraine and southern part of ukraine used to be part of the russian empire for centuries but the western ukraine where i'm from was uh, was part of poland between world war one and world war ii and a significant part of Western Ukraine was also part of Austro-Hungarian Empire before this. And uh, this is uh, one explanation why we have such significant regional differences, difference, uh, differences and conflicts in Ukraine. And I do not support Ukraine joining Russia in any form or uni, uh, any kind of form or way. And actually, I actually publicly always supported Ukraine becoming a member of the European Union. And I wanted okay. to, you can to become like Canada, like Western democracies, which are liberal democracies, uh, like Canada or Poland or Germany or Belgium and so on. So this is uh, kind of. So I, I think you and I probably inadvertently share pretty much the same viewpoint. I believe that the invasion of Ukraine is a war crime, obviously, and Putin's a monster. But I also suspect that there was more America could have done to prevent the invasion from taking place. And that's what you're saying. Yes. Yes. This okay. Is exactly, and this is based on my research. And I actually going to present a paper on this topic, on the war, um, which is going on at the Conference of American Political Science Association in Montreal in September of this year. So all my comments are based on my research, academic research, which, um, again, is not partisan in any way, but is based on evidence which I examine, and but actually, unfortunately, there is a problem with media coverage because media coverage is often very simplistic and not complete, and often uh, uh, kind of relies on a false um, or fake news. And for this reason, a lot of people have very simplified view of the current war. And and since I researched this conflict for professionally for a very long time, so I cannot just accept uh, or rely on media coverage because this is issue which I uh, rely on professionally and academically so i uh, i use evidence which is not made uh, publicly available in in the west in the western media and this is i think also a major issue why is this conflict is often right. misrepresented or is uh, kind of, uh, presented in such a way okay so uh, the minsk accords would you agree that that we're not talking enough in america about the Min minsk accords uh, yes, the uh, Minsk Accords were, uh, were actually one possibility to solve this conflict peacefully in Ukraine before the war started, because they provided for uh, autonomy of eastern Ukraine, but within uh, within uh, sovereign, sovereign Ukraine. And Russia agreed to this, and uh, there was such possibility of, uh, of basically resolving this conflict peacefully if all parties of this conflict would accept such um, such a deal, but unfortunately, uh, this um, there was no possibility or there was no such outcome, and um, Russia resorted to military invasion, uh, in particular um, because uh, Putin felt that only military pressure would cause Ukraine or Zelensky government to reach another kind of deal, but in terms which would be much more favorable to Russia, and the Minsk agreement were signed after Russian military interventions in the civil war in Donbass in 2015 and before this in 2014. So Russia already basically invaded Ukraine, but in um, only in a limited way in Donbass. And now basically uh, Putin is repeating this, but on much wider scale and much more destructive way. All right, let me ask you a couple of questions that could get me into trouble here in the United States. The Donbass region. Was Zelensky was the Ukrainian military firing on the Donbass region before Putin invaded Ukraine? Uh, yes, there was a significant fighting between uh, Russian, um, sorry, uh, Russian, Russian separatist forces 
and uh, Ukrainian military forces and uh, paramilitary formations in the bus since 2014. And uh, according to estimates from the United Nations, more than uh, 14,000 people were killed in this war, civil war in Donbass since 2014. And the fighting actually before the Russian invasion was uh, continued in, in this Donbass, in particular shelling from Ukrainian forces, but also from separatist forces. And But casualties were much smaller compared to what took place in 2014 and 2015. And there was no indication that the Ukrainian government forces planned to launch um, attack on Donbass as Putin falsely claimed uh, in order to justify his invasion of Ukraine. Right. But while President Biden, two weeks before the invasion, kept saying he's going to invade, there's no question about it. During that period, was Zelensky and the Ukrainian military escalating the missile attacks on the separatists in the Donbass region? Uh, yes, there was uh, increased uh, shelling uh, from Ukrainian forces of uh, Donbass um, territory and Donbass uh, locations, uh, but I think this was uh, aimed at uh, Donbass uh, separatist forces uh, and not at civilians, uh, because civilian right. casualties were relatively small compared to what right. took place after the Russian invasion and compared to what, had, uh, what the, was the case in 2014 and 2015. So, it's so the president of the United States, if he didn't want Putin to invade, conceivably he could have gotten on the phone with Zelensky and said, let's dial back the heat in Donbass. Let's not fire as many missiles right now. It looks like Putin's ready to attack. Is that a reasonable expectation? from an American president to call uh, the president? Yes, I think this is uh, this was a real possibility. And in addition to this also, Biden could have called uh, Zelensky to agree not to join NATO because there was no such possibility. And this is not just my speculation because actually there are tapes of a recording between Biden when he was vice president under President Obama and then President Poroshenko of Ukraine, who was president of Ukraine since um, in 2014, and 2019, and uh, basically in these tapes, uh, Biden um, was openly um, discussing uh, policies of Ukrainian government and appointment of top government leaders, and telling Poroshenko basically what to do and what not what not to do. And according to official transcript of uh, Ukrainian uh, Security and Defense Council in 2014, which was publicly released and is the official document, actually Western governments, in particular U.S. government, told. Ukrainian government in 2014 not to resist a Russian annexation of Crimea in order to prevent Russia from launching war with Ukraine, because there was already such possibility of war between Russia and Ukraine in 2014. But then, at that time, Western governments, in particular US government, and in particular President, uh, Vice President uh, then uh, Biden, uh, decided and, uh, and basically told Ukrainian government not to uh, use military force in order to stop and uh, to prevent such a war. So this was possibility to do this again in this conflict, but unfortunately this was not done. And I think this is a uh, tragedy for Ukraine and also have many negative effects on many other countries, including the United States. There was a phone call between Putin and Biden two weeks before the invasion. It lasted an hour. Biden got off the phone and said, he's going to, in he's going to invade. There's no talking to him. Putin made it clear that he did not want America to invite Ukraine into the EU and NATO and to stop courting republics along the Russian border for both the EU and NATO. Earlier, you said you were in favor of Ukraine joining the EU. Had President Biden said to Putin in December of last year, look, I'm not going to say this openly, but you got it. If you don't invade Ukraine, we will quietly stop courting Ukraine for the EU and NATO. Would that have satisfied Putin if Biden had quietly promised to stop trying to pull Ukraine into the West's orbit? 
Uh, I'm not sure if this was done quietly, if Russia would accept this, because Russia said that the previous uh, such uh, informal um, agreements, for instance, by NATO or assurances by NATO countries, leaders, including the United States, not to expand NATO in other countries in Eastern and Central Europe, like Poland or the Baltic states, which were given to Soviet and uh, Russian leaders, um, were not uh, fulfilled. Basically, uh, Putin justifies this by the failure of Western government, uh, governments to follow on their own uh, agreements, not to expand NATO. And he wanted formal, uh, formal agreement, uh, formal assurances from the United States or NATO, not to expand NATO. Uh, in right, but what, America had promised Gorbachev not to expand NATO if he would allow Germany to reunify. But, but that was a promise made to the Soviet Union that we wouldn't expand NATO. We never made that promise to Russia, correct? Uh, yes, uh, but I think there were also uh, promises afterwards to Russian leaders, to Yeltsin, and uh, Yeltsin also raised this issue. But uh, Russia considered itself successor to the Soviet Union. And um, this right. was, I think, kind of their view that uh, promises which were made to the Soviet Union and treaties which were signed by the Soviet Union were still fulfilled by Russia because Russia was considered to be a successful state or to, uh, uh, to the Soviet Union. But I think right. in another case, in case of the European Union, Russia formally did not object from UK in becoming a member of the European Union. So in this case, European Union membership could have been a solution to this conflict because uh, if European Union countries and the United States decided to kind of use this as a uh, a way to resolve this conflict, because in such case, UK would benefit, uh, Western countries would benefit from avoiding the war, and Russia did not object from uh, UK becoming a member of the European Union, uh, at least um, uh, publicly. And this is, I think, a, a suggestion which I offered before this conflict, uh, before this war started. Okay. Uh, I, I, I am so grateful that you're here, and we only have five more minutes, and there are three questions I wanted to ask you about. Maidan. Was that a coup orchestrated by the United States? I think this is very, yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, this is a very big issue. This is, I think, a very central issue. And I have this paper on this topic, which I'm currently research, uh, researching. And I can say that based on my studies, which I did about Maidan massacre, that um, this massacre of police and protesters in 2014 was a uh, was um, uh, key to violent overthrow of Ukrainian government, which was relatively uh, pro-Russian government. And um, this uh, massacre, again, led to, uh, to uh, then president of Ukraine basically fleeing to Russia because of assassination, assassination attempts against him. And this was the reason why uh, Ukrainian policy changed. And the Western governments, in particular US government, uh, de facto accepted this uh, transition. And I think this suggests at least that uh, Western governments, in particular US government, uh, supported de facto um, violent overthrow of Ukrainian government in 2014 by uh, means of, of such violence, which was uh, undemocratic. Okay, so, 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 I under, so I understand this. Yanukovych, who was considered a puppet of Putin's, was the president of Ukraine. He ended up leaving uh, after Maidan with about $15 billion. There was violence. Uh, there was shooting on Maidan Square. I know that you have videos. So are you saying who, who was doing committing the violence? Was it do we know who, who was doing the shooting on the protesters? You're, you're yes, saying I researched, it was... I researched this for eight years. And there are videos which shows there were snipers in Maidan control locations and there were Maidan snipers. There were uh, public admissions by um, 14 members of Maidan sniper groups about uh, their involvement in this massacre. And then this so is they, the yeah. snipers, yeah. the so snipers they, were, were siding with America or Russia? Who were the, who they were the they snipers? They were siding with Western supported opposition. So they were part of Western supported opposition, including far right organizations. I see. Uh, we have limited time. So you're so you do you do say that the Maidan uprising was, in fact, a Western staged coup. I, no, I cannot say this. I'm not sure if this was a uh, regime change, a U.S. led regime change, which have right. in many other countries. If this was a coup, a coup or a coup or it was or if this was a revolution, 
in particular far-right led revolution. I think there are various elements of this uh, different uh, kind of events taking place, and I'm not sure yet what is decisive in this regard because public documents about US government involvement are not yet uh, made public, so I cannot say definitely what happens. And this is, uh, I think, a very important issue. You, would you agree that Russia and Ukraine are equally corrupt, that they're both controlled by oligarchs, and that these oligarchs are a result of Western bankers helping these oligarchs loot the nation's treasury? Um, yes, Ukraine and Russia are very corrupt countries, but in contrast to Russia, in which uh, Putin basically took control over oligarchs. After, soon after he came to power. In Ukraine, oligarchs are still very important and very powerful. And um, Western governments basically supported Ukrainian government uh, uh, and, uh, and including oligarchs, which are Western oligarchs, not because they are not corrupt or because they are democratic, but because they are very useful against Russia. I think this is the main reason why the Western government supported uh, Ukrainian um, uh, governments, in particular during the war with Russia. Last question. Well, I hope you'll come back because this is, I, I want to thank Professor Bill Greenberg for recommending you because this is, uh, we're, we've been talking endlessly about this war. Finally, and this is a loaded question, is Zelensky a Nazi? Is the Azov Battalion in charge? of the Donbass region, is the military of Ukraine controlled by Nazis? Uh, I said this issue, obviously, Zelensky is not, a, is, not, is not a Nazi in any way or form. So this is like false claim by Putin. But Azov uh, regiment is actually led by the neo-Nazi party and the neo-Nazi organization. And it's uh, de facto, uh, again, a far-right uh, led organization of far-right uh, military unit in Ukraine. And this is based on my research, which is presented in top conferences in the United States, publishing peer-reviewed articles and journal articles. So I'm sure about this. So this is kind of 100% asset in this regard from based on my research. Is there a Nazi problem in Ukraine? Uh, there, are, there is a far-right problem in Ukraine. Even so, uh, neo-Nazi organizations and far-right are not very popular in Ukraine. They fail in elections but they have a uh, very significant power, informal power, and they were able to influence uh, even decisions by Zelensky in particular because he was elected as peace president and he wanted to, to do a peace uh, deal with uh, Putin uh, soon after his election, but far-right organizations, in particular neo-Nazi-led uh, group, which was led, uh, linked to Azov, basically the civilian branch stopped Zelensky from doing this by threatening basically violence against him and his, and, uh, his uh, overthrow similar to what happened during the uh, Maidan in 2014 when far-right uh, organizations took a very active role in overthrow of the Russian government. Well, we ha unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. We've been talking with Professor Ivan Kachaovsky, professor at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa, author of Cleft Countries, Regional Political Divisions and Cultures in Post-Soviet Ukraine and Moldova, and co-author of Historical Dictionary of Ukraine. Well, I can't thank you enough for this. Uh, I, there's some things uh, I have to reevaluate, some things that I thought, and you reconfirmed a lot of what I uh, believed. Will you please come back? Okay, yes, yeah, this would be great. Thank you for the invitation. So it was a pleasure to well, it, thank, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much.